Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Retail Council of Canada's seventh webinar in the Enabling Retail webinar series. My name is Patrick Rogerson, Manager of Member Programs. As always, just a quick reminder that if for individuals submitting questions throughout our webinar today, please take advantage of the question and answer feature or the chat feature on the bottom right-hand side of WebEx. If you have any questions post-webinar, please feel free to either call or email me directly, and I'd be happy to address your questions at that time. We've got a tight time frame for today. Um, we're planning on having everything wrapped up by 1.45, so please prepare your questions ahead of time, and we'll be addressing them starting at 1.30. But our agenda for today, we'll be looking at the roles and types of support persons, and the roles and types of support persons and animals that exist for individuals with disabilities. And we're gonna look at this from both the employee and the customer standpoint. We're also gonna look at barriers to employment and how they can be removed through job coaches and service animals. Then we'll touch on etiquette with respect to not only an employee or a customer with a disability, but also the support person and support animal and how to address each. Finally, we'll wrap up with available support services with respect to a support person or an animal. Now today I have the pleasure of being rejoined by one presenter and the, uh, the benefit of a new presenter. Um, to my right I have Jesse Preston from Epilepsy Toronto. He is a job developer and facilitator that joined us for webinar number six on epilepsy. And we're also joined remotely by Ian Ashworth, Director of Program Development with Lions Foundation of Canada Dog Guides. Jesse, Ian, welcome today. Thank you. Thank you, it's great to be here. So maybe before we just begin, um, Jesse, I'll start with you, and then Ian will go to your side. Just provide our audience just a quick update once again, Jesse, on what your role is and what Epilepsy Toronto actually performs. So my role as a job developer is to assist uh, people with disabilities who are ready, willing, and wanting to work with, um, with employers and opportunities and facilitating um, um, the transfer from, from seeking a job into uh, maintaining and keeping a job. Okay. And Ian, for yourself? Um, so I work here at, at a, our organization is a charity um, which provides um, people right across Canada with various types of service dogs um, to aid and assist them uh, in the challenges that they face. Excellent. So gentlemen, we'll be going back and forth, and I know our questions are going to delineate from the support person to the support animal side. So Jesse, the first one's for you here. Um, we've done a brief kind of review of what your respective roles are, but let's talk about support persons for a second. Really, what is their primary intent with respect to a person with a disability? How do they serve within a certain type of role? What's their design or purpose? So the purpose of a support person is to support an individual with a, with a disability in um, different facets of uh, everyday living, everything from work to shopping um, to, um, to training for things like TTC. Um, this slide has a number of uh, common common types of support people. You have uh, interpreters and interveners um, for deaf and deafblind, uh, service workers, developmental service workers, and personal support workers. So these might be um, with people who have some, some, a variety of different disabilities, um, everything from mobility to, um, to developmental disabilities. Um, you have life coaches. Life coaches uh, do a variety of different um, Different training, everything from TTC training um, down how to uh, how you do basic life skills at home, uh, and that can of course can include shopping in the in retail stores. Mm -hmm. um, job coaches. Now, job coaches are interesting, and I'll I'll talk a lot more about that later. But uh, you can have on-site and off-site job coaches, so they might be identified or someone who just might be there in the background who's providing a little bit more context and support. And I'll, I'll touch more on that a little bit later. Uh, there's the job coach, sorry, a job developer or a job analyst, which is my role. Um, and part of that is going out into, into a retail organization uh, and learning the business. Uh, and that can either be through the eyes of a customer or through an informational interview and getting that information and 
helping uh, to develop strategies or processes that will help uh, an individual obtain and maintain employment. Now, uh, last week we talked a little bit about um, buddy systems for someone who has epilepsy, you know, someone who has first aid, uh, seizure first aid training and is able to assist an individual uh, in the event that they may have a seizure and they may be in an existing role as an employee. Um, on the customer side, you're looking at uh, family members, friends, someone who's not necessarily identified or has a different relationship to the person with a disability and just happens to be in that role at that particular time. Perfect. Now, Ian, I know this is somewhat analogous. Just like support persons, we also have many different roles that support animals can support a person with a disability on. But I'm looking for a little bit more context into what that looks like. So what type of supports are available from service animals today? Mm -hmm. um, well, the first type of uh, uh, dog that, that assists people is the traditional sort of guide dog or what we call our canine vision dogs. And, uh, and these are the dogs that have, have been in use for, for many, many decades now. Um, and they provide mobility for the visually impaired person. Um, uh, most people call them either guide dogs or seeing eye dogs, but, uh, but most people have been involved in that for, for uh, many, many, many years. More recently, there's been um, uh, other types of assistance dogs that have been uh, developed um, as we realize how, how dogs um, and animals can help people. Um, we also use uh, hearing ear dogs that can assist the deaf or hard of hearing, um, and they alert uh, their handlers to sounds you know, within the house. Um, so if the front doorbell goes, their dog will go and um, sort of uh, pat them or uh, jump up at them and then take them to the source of that sound to the front door um, or to the telephone. And we train those dogs to a number of different sounds um, including um, fire alarms, um, and again, that's very important in the workplace as well. When you get somebody with a, um, a hearing uh, impediment in the workplace that would um, miss, miss those sort of alerts. Um, we also train service dogs that um, assist people with a physical disability, and uh, they you know, usually work with um, people in, in power chairs or wheelchairs, but sometimes with walking frames and they walk um, you know, nicely by the side of, of those um, other assistive devices. They'll help you know, retrieve dropped items off the floor. They'll, um, they can help opening doors when there's the you know, power push buttons, things like that, um, but also can um, uh, assist by you know, barking for help if the person gets into, into, issue, into trouble, um, especially if somebody has you know, a very sort of poor voice um, and, and, and finds it difficult to, uh, to ask for help themselves, they can train, we train their dogs to do that. Um, also as well, there's, there's seizure response dogs um, that, uh, that we train here at Dog Guides and they assist people with epilepsy. And uh, when somebody has a seizure, especially if they are isolated or by, live by themselves, um, we train these dogs to bark for help in response to the seizure. Um, and uh, we can also train them to um, hit the lifeline buttons or activate an alert system. Um, and again, we can train those dogs to retrieve things like a um, cordless phone if the person has injured themselves um, as a result of their seizure. Um, and also provide that you know, companionship and, and support uh, to the person post seizure when they're feeling, you know, if they're feeling disorientated um, and anxious, then their, their dog is there. Um, more recently, we've, we've uh, introduced a program for autism assistance dogs that help children uh, with autism spectrum disorder. And uh, they work with, with the children that, that face the challenges of living with autism by providing safety. A lot of children um, are flight risks they will they will run they will bolt um, and uh, and their their parents or, or caregivers have uh, have you know problems trying to keep the child um, you know close by them especially in dangerous and busy situa situations we train our dogs to act as anchors they they can be attached to the child um, by a belt 
um, that is attached to the dog's harness and that can keep them safe. Um, but also it can provide many other um, sort of companionship roles um, by reducing the child's anxiety, um, helping with sleep patterns by, by sleeping with the child and the pressure of the dog and companionship helps um, with their sleep patterns. Um, and we're introducing a lot of these dogs to school, school situations now um, and doing a lot of training in schools um, uh, where, where the, the, children can go, the children can go with their dogs. And then our most recent program, which is the, the first accredited program of its type in Canada, is our Diabetic Alert Dog Program. Um, and these dogs use their amazing uh, sense of smell to assist people with type 1 diabetes. And um, we train them actually to, de to detect the difference in scent when somebody's, when their uh, handler's blood sugar drops, um, the, the, somebody's uh, breath changes, their sweat changes, and dogs can, can detect this and alert their handlers um, to, uh, to get some sugar um, to, uh, to help increase their, their blood sugar level. So uh, a lot of the dogs now, many and varied, um, and on top of those sort of more recognized uh, service dogs, then there are obviously you know, therapy dogs as well that, that can assist in lots of other different situations. But so these I, are the main I, types of dogs. So, you know, that would probably lend itself to a, an extra question here that I have. When we look at the six different types of support, we'll say dogs at this point in time, just limit it to that for a minute. Yeah. Uh, very often we see vision, hearing, if a person has a physical disability, the animal, yep. I've seen that readily used in workplaces. But what's the frequency with respect to seizure response dogs, um, an individual who may be a high uh, level operating individual with autism working and integrating their support animal into the workplace? Do you find that that is actually prevalent today in Ontario or even across Canada? Um, yes, it is. Um, with our, our seizure response dogs, um, we we do have several several people. I mean, there's not there's not a huge amount, but there's several people that that, that I know of that um, are working, and their dogs um, you know accompany them to work. And uh, on one one particular a person that I know of is that was was actually um, you know in a in a store cupboard where then she had a seizure. Um, and did actually hit her head. Her dog barked for help, and um, and uh, you know help was very quickly you know forthcoming. Um, so they de definitely do help um, you know by accompanying their their handlers in the workplace. With our autism assistance dogs, that's that's more for children. We we just train children between three and twelve years old, so um, that's more uh, prevalent in the school situation. Um, okay. where these dog, dogs are assisting the, the children in the school environment. Now, a little bit of a harder question here. To the best of my knowledge, and I'm, I'm hoping you can provide an answer to us from the best of yours, there's always a discrepancy between what a legitimate support animal is and a therapy animal. Yep. Today, are dogs the only animal that is being officially used as a service or support animal in Canada? Um, pretty well, Patrick. Yes, it is a very grey area, and it is it is one that is um, you know continuously open for discussion. But at the moment, um, there is uh, a general consensus that um, dogs um, are are specially trained and provided uh, to do these specific jobs and and act as as uh, in the roles that they have. The therapy animal, animal model um, is one that is certainly recognized worldwide um, and is, is gaining ground here um, in Canada, but has a long way to go um, for, for two reasons, really. First of all, because obviously tradition, you know, dogs have traditionally been, been looked on as, as the animals of choice, but also as well, unfortunately, um, there, there have been sort of some cases of abuse by people wanting to take their pet dogs places or, or get accommodations with their pet dogs by stating that, that yeah, it's their therapy dogs. And it's, and it's very hard then to sort of draw the line where um, is this a, a, a genuine uh, therapy dog 
um, providing, you know, support for this person, or is somebody just, you know, sort of misrepresenting um, the fact that, that it's their own pet dog and they're trying to get access with it? And, and so it is, you know, a very gray area, not just in Canada, but, but across the world as well. But there are, there are some animals that are being used um, absolutely for therapy, but, but very few bit far between. And there's very little um, sort of uh, accreditation given to that at the moment um, in terms of other animals. So, Ian, let's imagine I'm a retailer for a moment, and I'm hoping to differentiate between what a supporter service animal is, a legitimate one, yeah. um, permit them into my workplace if it's a customer bringing them in, or if it is a prospect employee that may need accommodations when they're hired on to uh, the respective head office or at one of the retail locations for a retailer. How can that retailer differentiate? What's the best way for them to go about finding this information? Uh, first and foremost, the animal should um, have some sort of identification. So, you know, with all our dogs and, and sort of accredited schools across Canada, and I'll touch on that a little bit further uh, a bit later on, but uh, accredited schools across Canada, our dogs all wear harnesses of, of some description. And that harness identifies the organization that provided the dog and in lots of situations actually describes the job that the dog is doing um, as well. So first and foremost, that is um, an easy, you know, a, a, an easy way to identify the dog because it is, uh, it does have a visible harness on um, from an accredited school. Um, the other thing that a lot of people are doing now is um, if they do have um, a, a genuine reason to have an animal or a dog, is they are getting um, doctors' um, uh, notes and prescriptions saying that, yes, um, I, I do have this, face this challenge, it doesn't have to be specified, um, and this, this animal is, is assisting me, you know, to, to help with that challenge. So two ways really is, is you know, they can provide some sort of uh, medical record to, uh, to indicate that this, is, this dog is, um, is genuinely helping them, um, but also that there is a harness uh, on the dog as well. Perfect. So, gentlemen, thank you for kind of establishing the baseline here. Let's go to the, the more critical part for our audience today on the aspect of employment and job coaching with respect to a support person, but also we'll touch on the support animals in the workplace. So, Jesse, let's start with you looking at kind of the model you fleshed out, job coaching model called the declining model. So this is one of my favorite um, models for job coaching, um, and uh, it's very beneficial for employees who are just starting out um, in the workplace, so when they're at the time that they're hired, um, or very early on. And the, um, the benefits are, are there's a lot of intensive support right at the beginning of employment, and then it sort of declines over time uh, depending on the employee's needs. Uh, so it's, again, really good for a startup. Uh, the, the focus is to get the, the rudimentary part of the, of the job and the certain tasks and duties that are required and assisting the employee either in processing them, learning strategies to, to do the work or helping with, say, rote memory, getting them to learn the tasks and get it into their long-term memory as opposed to their short-term memory. Um, and that can also involve procedural memory. Um, so if you think of something as mundane as brushing your teeth, there's 25 steps to brushing your teeth. And just to give you an idea, you get out of bed, you walk into the bathroom, you, you turn on the sink, you open the cabinet, you pull the toothpaste out, you pull the, I've already gone through 10 steps and we haven't even, we haven't even gotten anywhere yet. And it's that kind of stuff that you do almost systematically, it's called procedural memory, where it's just automatic and we help people with job coach, uh, through job coaching apply that to tasks at work. So things like stocking a shelf, what steps are involved in stocking a shelf, that you can do that um, efficient, efficiently. So we generally start off when it comes to job coaching with a brief on the person's disability and challenges because every individual with a disability is unique in um, not just their disabilities but their abilities as well. So we want to have an idea of the person that we're dealing with. Uh, after that, we do a job analysis. Generally speaking, we do it uh, the first week on the job. So we go in with them and actually 
learn the environment. And part of that can also be that the employee with a disability is being job coach can be teaching the job coach the job. And this has two benefits. One, it helps the person process the information because you're not just absorbing it, but you have to be proactive in teaching it. So you're processing it in two different fronts. Um, as well as, um, yeah, and then we look at things like environment, proce um, procedures that are in place, um, the tasks and tools they're going to be using, and it's all within the uh, context of the person's uh, disability. And from there we develop uh, a, a plan and a set of resources for the individual. So this could be um, processes at work, a certain set of accommodations, um, uh, skill development of any kind, uh, education for employees, and assistive devices. And I'll, I'll tell a little story actually. We helped a gentleman who was in a, it was a warehousing situation. He was taking phone calls, uh, and he was having he was having a quite a bit of difficulty. He had uh, multiple disabilities. Uh, he had glaucoma, uh, a visual impairment, and a memory disability, uh, in addition to a learning disability. So this gentleman would be taking a phone call, and he wasn't able to effectively write out uh, a phone message. Further to that, he wouldn't be able to hold the information in his head longer than 30 seconds. So he wasn't able to even remember the message all that well. Not very good when you're trying to take a message and the message is not very legible. So this was the, uh, this was the initial information that we got. We went in and did an assessment. And what we had, what we had decided to do was, was use things like adaptive technology and a process in that we put in place to help the individual perform his job. So there's a, a remarkable software um, called Dragon Natural Speaking. It's text-to-speech technology, which uh, you may be familiar with from your phones, iPhone, Android, and so forth. Uh, and everything this gentleman would say over the phone would literally be typed out in a Microsoft uh, Outlook document. And at the end of every message, it's very customary to repeat back the message to the person on the other end of the phone, hence typing out the message on the on the email, and he would just fire it off in an email to whatever department um, it was addressed to. So to basically to get to get down to it, what we needed to do was help the individual by training him on the technology, training him on the process, and um, getting him to learn the the different systems and processes in addition to other things like TTC training and so forth. Now, Jesse, there's a, <clears throat> sorry, there's a couple other steps here as well too. Um, there's an, uh, as part of a declining model, there is an exiting of the support person still, correct? Or is there constant touch points? Yeah, so um, there's several things that can be done at the end um, and it's, it's all very dependent on each individual each individual's needs. So at that point we review what occurred with the plan and we decide what is the best option. So either we do an extension, which is we increase, we, we basically go for another couple of weeks, mm -hmm. again on a declining model. Uh, the person may be proficient, in which case we terminate the service, or we flip to a secondary um, job coaching model called the uh, case management model. So this is the most, um, the most recognized model and it's, uh, it's often used by ODSP service providers, Ontario Disability Support Program. And it's uh, basically a series of check-ins to see how the individual person is doing and, you know, discussing. So what sort of challenges did you face in the workplace? Or is there any issues with your performance? How are things going on? Is there any resources we can provide? Um, and uh, assisting someone in, in that capacity. It's, uh, a, I find this one is also used a lot in corporate, um, and it's much more long-term, but again, there are very, there are set check-ins. Okay. Now, Ian, how does that work with respect to support animals in the workplace? Okay, so, well, the first thing is to um, create awareness of, of the support animal in the workplace. You know, what what job is, is the dog or, or animal doing? Um, what 
what is the uh, sort of function of that? How does it fit in with with the person's sort of day to day, you know, working in within the workplace? So what we tend we will do then is we will um, go into a situation and um, provide information. A lot of people um, get a bit very hesitant. Oh, we've never had a dog here before. We've never, um, you know, done this. Um, a lot of people recognize guide dogs or seeing eye dogs, but quite often um, may be ignorant of, of other um, ways that dog helps. So we will um, talk to, um, to staff and to organizations. We'll, um, you know, do um, uh, orientation uh, sort of lectures and talks and things like that, question and answers, to make sure that people are aware that this isn't just an ordinary dog. It is a, a, a highly trained service dog. Um, and uh, and this is what it does for this person. Um, alongside that, it's it's you know all the the very basic things. We're having a dog in the workplace. Where's it going to sleep? Does it need food? Does it need a water bowl? What about its bathroom needs? You know, it, it, it's an animal coming into the workplace. Um, what are all those um, uh, situations that that we need to look at? And again, we we can help with that. Um, uh, talking through with, with management and co-workers um, and the individuals themselves, um, you know, where the best places are, um, where is appropriate for those, those sort of areas to be. Um, and, and this is all sort of fully integrated with, with the individual handler, the person who has the dog, and their co-workers or, or management or whoever is involved. Um, and, and that leads me on to the, you know, the, the last point there is making sure that those um, co-workers and management um, are uh, able to, to deal with what the dog is doing. For example, you know, with our seizure response dogs, how do they respond if, if the dog starts barking? You know, wh what happens? What do they need to do? Um, do they involve themselves or do they ignore the situation? So it's training the co-workers um, you know, what to do if the dog is performing its job. Um, if it's a guide dog or seeing eye dog, then, you know, it, the dog is working independently and, and there's very little that needs doing. Um, however, however, if somebody does have um, a medical issue that the dog helps with, it's, it's training the people to react and respond to that. Um, and we go in as an organization to work with the individual and the, org and the, uh, the workplace to uh, to make sure all those things are in place. Okay, gentlemen, let's move on to etiquette. And Jesse, we talked about this in webinar number six, so some refresher points, I think, for our audience, and then Ian, we'll go to you. Um, absolutely, so uh, the important thing is to address the customer, not the support person. Sometimes the support person will, will redirect you depending on, on their role. Um, look at the customer when speaking, um, especially if uh, there's a hearing impairment because uh, they can read lips. Um, the support person may not even identify themselves um, due to confidentiality reasons as a uh, someone who sometimes does a bit of job coaching. I generally do not identify myself because they don't need to know. Um, job coaches can have different, different roles, so because of confidentiality, they might um, be in the workplace as something else. Um, and to do a very, very quick quick overview, it might be um, someone who's there to learn the role as a job shadow, or at least that's how they present it to other employees for confidentiality reasons. And the, the important thing is, is if when it comes to, um, to being with uh, individuals that have support people, if you don't know the proper etiquette, just ask. Mm -hmm. they'll, they'll tell you. I think a lot of people always worry that they may offend someone accidentally, but you're right. It's the simple question, probably the best way to handle it. Now, Ian, in the case of animals? Yeah, um, well, very similar, actually, um, because we do get people actually talking to the dogs instead of the actual customer or person themselves. Um, but the, the big one uh, is, is the first point. Absolutely, you know, no petting, feeding, or distracting the support animal. Um, you know, these are working animals, highly trained, and uh, to distract them in any way can not only be dangerous, but also, you know, effectively detrains the dogs. One of the good things is that, that our dogs are um, well-behaved socially, and, um, and that's an important thing, in, especially in the workplace. By um, distracting or feeding or any other things like that, 
that can detrain the dog and, and make it, you know, a nuisance. So please, please, in any situation, the, that's the, the big things to avoid. Um, from the other uh, side of the coin, the actual handlers themselves do need to be sympathetic of their co-workers um, or customers of um, any fear and allergies. And I'm, I know we're going to talk a little bit about that later on as well. But, um, you know, there's, there's ways to explain, um, you know, the role of the dog um, and the fact that it is highly trained to, to allay those fears. And also as well, you know, in a, in a large sort of, um, especially corporate situation with a, with a big office with um, good air exchange system, allergies usually aren't, aren't an issue. Um, also as well, similarly, um, if you are unsure about what to do or whatever, just ask the, the handler. Um, they may need assistance at some time um, with, with something, um, and it's, it's definitely, rather than just sort of uh, grabbing the dog's leash and doing something, you know, ask the, the person first, um, address your questions to them, and they're, um, they're more than happy to explain the role of their dog and, and the way that they would need assistance. Now, Ian, on that thread, I, I, there's a question that came in from the audience already, which I think is just perfect at this time to ask. Um, recently, there was an article that was uh, released in uh, Toronto, and it was on a woman who was denied service based on um, an employee at the location she was visiting. This wasn't a retailer, but the staffer was fearing the animal, her dog, that she had brought with her. Um, can a person be denied service based on the employee or an employer who may have a fear or phobia of the support animal? Um, I, I don't have any legal background, so I can only talk from my experience. But um, it is a it is a very difficult area, and and you know is on occasions you know tried in 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 courts, and with, certainly with the. Um, human rights um, uh, issues that it that it brings up, but um, my understanding is is that no, it it can't be, it can't happen. Um, you should uh, still have uh, the obligation to serve that person with a disability, regardless of not you know whether your the dog is there. Um, however, you know if people are feeling uncomfortable, I'm sure that there are ways around that where. You can get somebody else to serve that person or assist that person. Um, and also as well, the other point is, um, is education and giving the person chance to explain that it is a highly trained dog. They have no aggression. They don't bite. They don't um, attack or, or anything like that. They are not trained for that. Um, and socially, these dogs are, are very, very well behaved. So, um, you know, the person can allay the fears by explaining, you know, the, the level of training, um, but also as well, there is always a way around, um, you know, these situations by, you know, just asking someone else to, to assist. Yeah, I think it really comes down to a, the whole idea of can we accommodate. Uh, exactly. Without hitting that point of undue hardship, and I know yep. we won't get into that today, but that's really where any employer needs to look at that aspect. So, Absolutely. Let's transition to that component now for the retailers listening. What type of support services can they receive um, or where should they go, Jesse, when it comes to support persons? So when it comes to support persons, there's, um, especially in servicing things like job coaches, there's a number of different organizations and a number of different resources that I'll share. Um, in almost every city, there's a directory of nonprofits. In Toronto, it's referred to as Toronto 211. There is um, uh, another list called Ontario 211, although I like the uh, Toronto resource uh, is more um, has a has a larger has a larger pool, especially for the GTA. Mm -hmm. uh, all ODSP service providers do have different services depending on the individual in which they are serving. So, and there's a lot of a lot of those particular service providers are geared towards a specific disability. Example. Epilepsy Toronto is geared towards people with epilepsy. There were a number of other presenters um, in previous presentations that have their own specialties as well. Um, and uh, it's always through employment support. 
there's a wonderful, um, wonderful project going on right now called Ready, Willing, and Able. And they have money for um, developmental disabilities and autism. Uh, and they do pay for, for job coaches. And they farm it out to the individual uh, service providers, um, like Epilepsy Toronto. Uh, the Canadian uh, Council on Rehabilitation and Work is another resource. And uh, well, of course, uh, Epilepsy Toronto. And Ian, with respect to support animals? Um, so obviously our organization, um, Lions Foundation of Canada, Canada Dog Guides, um, we provide a, a wide range of, of dogs for Canadians with disabilities, and we are a national charity. Um, however, there are um, uh, many other uh, organizations within Canada also providing um, you know, guide and service dogs. And um, unfortunately, there, there's no um, legislation um, governing uh, you know, the supply and training of, of guidance service dogs. So anybody can set up um, as, a, as, a, as a trainer to provide um, a guide or a service dog. So many years ago, um, there was two um, uh, organizations that were started um, by members to create, um, you know, high minimum standards within the industry. And uh, for, for guide dogs or seeing eye dogs, um, any uh, accredited organization um, that trains dogs to a, a high standard is a member of the International Guide Dog Federation. So if you are um, wondering whether an organization is, is accredited and, and is a, 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 an able and competent organization, then you can refer to the International Guide Dog Federation for just guide and service dogs, uh, just guide dogs, sorry. And then Assistance Dogs International is, uh, does the same um, job, but for other types of service dogs, cover, covering uh, not just service dogs, but all the, the dogs that I've mentioned previously, and, and therapy dogs as well. And really, it's looking for organizations that are accredited by one of those two um, bodies. Okay. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much. Um, we've got your information posted on the screen now for those watching. Um, should they wish to contact you, I know that they've got the freedom to reach out at any point in time with questions or to get some clarification. Um, you'll be around for some questions which are already coming in at this point in time. For those attending today, uh, please submit your questions at your leisure. We will stay on the phone for about 10 minutes still just to address those. We'll go on a brief pause for one moment and then we will have some questions for Jesse and Ian. Ian, first question for you. Yep. How do we address a situation of employees with allergies towards dogs, but an employee with a disability also requires their service dog to work? How would you respond to this retailer's question? Okay, it's, I mean, it is a, a difficult situation because you have to be aware of, um, of both parties, um, you know, requirements and needs, and it's setting up a dialogue to discuss that. Um, more often than not, and again, it's in my experience, which is, which is pretty lengthy, I haven't as yet seen um, a serious anaphylactic um, situation with dog allergies. Um, a lot of dog allergies uh, that we come across are by contact. Um, so either the dog licks somebody or the, somebody is petting a dog. Both of those situations aren't applicable to a service dog. You should not be petting. You should not have direct contact with the dog. Um, but also in a, in a uh, larger environment, um, and especially you know, one with hard floors and things like that, um, unless a dog is in a, a small environment with carpets and things like that, there is very little issue um, with, with allergies when it comes to the dog hair um, and things like that. Um, if there is, uh, you know, a small office scenario, for example, where it's carpeted floors, um, then again, it's, it's a matter of, of um, adjusting the workplace scenario so that both people's um, uh, challenges are, are, are met. It's accommodating both people's needs. That's, that's the way to, to work around it. 
However, I will you know stress again that um, in a larger workplace scenario, it, it's it's seldom an issue. I haven't come across it as yet in a in a you know a big uh, big workplace scenario. Okay, thank you, Jesse. The next one's for you. Can you provide me examples where retailers faced a barrier during the integration of an employee and either a support person or animal, and how were they able to overcome that? So when it comes to uh, barriers from, um, in, in terms of integrating, um, there are several uh, obstacles that we've faced in the past. One of them is um, knowledge of, of exactly what job coaching is. Um, so I, I've gotten this objection a few times, especially with the declining model. Uh, well, we can't have two people doing the same job. It, it just doesn't make sense from a cost point of view. And I get that, but the where 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 that's different is, is that this person is temporary and they will be leaving. Then the question becomes, well, what what sort of supports does this person need after? So, and that all goes back to the plan um, that we develop on an individual basis of what it looks like for this individual to stay there. You know, what processes, what procedures does this person need follow-ups? Does this person need um, a buddy system, not so much for uh, seizures, but maybe someone, a go-to person? Um, everyone in the, we, we tell people that we're job coaching, everyone is on, on team uh, John or team Edward or team Amanda or team whatever, they're all there to support you and other employees have knowledge that you can tap into. So there, there's ways around um, around that where there's go-to people that you can talk to and, and get additional information, mentors in the workplace. We've done stuff along that line. Perfect. Well, gentlemen, that's all the time we have for today. Um, Jesse, Ian, thank you very much for attending. For those on, uh, from our audience, thank you very much for attending Retail Council of Canada's seventh webinar. We look forward to seeing you for our eighth webinar in two weeks, which will focus on accessibility needs with respect to mental health that will be led by the Beer Store. Thanks and have a great day. Thank you.